Friday night and there's 60 of you here. This is a fabulous chapter. stunned and amazed. I thought there'd be seven of us and I'd have all the cookies to myself. <laughs> but, uh, I'm Bob Power, Executive Director for Santa Clara Valley Audubon. And in uh, early August, I was on the middle fork of the Salmon River and Arvin decided to put my name in uh, something about program in your newsletter. And when I got back from that trip, I thought maybe I ought to follow through. So truth in advertising, this presentation may or may not have anything to do with what you read in the newsletter, it'll probably come close, but might be a little bit, a little bit off of what you expected. But we're going to call this uh, CNPS and SCVAS when worlds collide. And for 27 bonus points, one of the remaining cookies and a uh, glass of hot tea, which Santa Clara County Park is this picture taken from? Al, Al, oh, Al Rock, good. yeah. I don't know if there's enough cookies to go around. <laughs> phenomenal. We're going to make this interactive. Um, if anybody has any questions or any comments, uh, please uh, just shout them out when you have them uh, so we don't stay too late when, I'm, when we're done. And of course, uh, there'll be a chance for Q&A when I'm done as well. Um, but you all remember this Venn diagrams. You got one set, you got another set, two collide, and there's some, something going on in the middle there that's common to both sets. So this is the um, world premiere of the CNPS SCVAS Venn diagram. <laughs> you are a part of history. So uh, that little birdie in the middle is uh, Cedar Waxwing. And I hope, I, I'm just praying that whatever it's feeding on is a native. <laughs> Well, we're going to have to pretend. We're going to have to pretend. No, it's a toy on. It's yeah, great. Exactly. It's a toy on. So I need to, you know, I know I saw a lot of uh, uh, old friends in the audience tonight. And, um, a lot of folks are familiar with the organization. We have a lot of members in the audience tonight. Uh, so I'm probably going to cover some ground that you're familiar with, but oftentimes with our organizations, even when we're really um, closely tied to the organization, it doesn't hurt to remember uh, who we are and what we do, and what's important to the organization. So before we get to that true Venn diagram um, synthesis, uh, we're going to cover some other ground first. But uh, Santa Clara Valley Audubon is here to uh, preserve, enjoy, restore, and foster public awareness of native birds and their ecosystems. The ecosystems are where you guys come in, and uh, uh, incredibly important that we have the native plants that are going to keep our birds alive and keep our birds thriving. We've got four full-time staff for Santa Clara Valley Audubon. We do employ between three and five uh, interns every year. We've got 12 board members, we've got 900 local members, and we've got a whole mess of volunteers just mm -hmm. like you do. We do, we run a, just a boatload of education programs. The flagship education program is the Wetlands Discovery Program, which is now in its 24th year and uh, combines both an in-class component and a field trip component. Field trip uh, using one of our favorite uh, park systems, uh, Shoreline and Mountain View. I hope it's one of yours as well, quite a, quite a beautiful place to visit. Um, I won't go too far into that, into that program because that's not the focus of tonight, but just to give you an overview of the kinds of programs that we have. And then beyond uh, the flagship education program, we do a bunch of young Audubon programs for homeschoolers and scout groups. We do all kinds of adult education classes, that's where most of you uh, would come in. We, we have seen you on many of our field trips, some of our classes. We hope to see you on future field trips. We run um, almost 100 field trips per year. Almost every weekend from September through May, we've got uh, some excellent field trip leader out in the field, uh, very similar to the kinds of programs that you put on, a little bit different focus from native plants to uh, our, our native breeding birds and others. Our flagship um, education uh, event, our flagship program, is the Wetlands Discovery Program. Our flagship event is our Wildlife Education Day on October 26th. 
we're going to have our 22nd annual Wildlife Education Day. And this is where we invite in somewhere between 20 and 30 environmental organizations um, from around the Bay, not just the South Bay, extending from uh, the Monterey Peninsula up to Sonoma County and out to the Sierra Foothills, the best and the brightest. And they come down to McClellan Ranch in Cupertino, they set up a booth, they do all kinds of neat creepy crawly critters and snakes and spiders and uh, wild animals. Santa Clara, Santa Clara County Open Space Authority is represented, Youth Science Institute, Environmental Volunteers, all of our favorite friends, Marine Mammal Center, oh my goodness, <laughs> there's the Venn Diagram in Action, California Native Plant Society, Rolling Hills 4-H, Beekeepers Guild, who knew that there was a bat conservancy <laughs> of coastal California? So this is under one roof, and it's not under a roof. It's, it's out in the, you know, the fresh air. Um, we bring everybody together in October and try to educate the world about what's out there in terms of environmental activity and, and environmental education. We think it's a gateway experience for youth in the area to see what's going on in the world of the environment, but it's a gateway experience for adults as well. If you've got uh, kids, or you've got free time, or you've got grandkids, or you have friends who are interested in the environment, you want to know what's going on in the world, this would be the one-stop shopping experience to get out and take a look at what's going on. We do California Wildlife and Habitats poster contest, birdhouse building. Some people are really happy to build pine cone feeders. <laughs> Some maybe not so much. Like I said, spiders and snakes. And then we've got these, all of these youngsters who come and man the booths and just provide this great energy and show the, the uh, youth of the area what role models are available in um, the environmental arena, our city forest. And then for the second year this year, um, the Wildcat Fund of Sonoma County is going to bring uh, live cats to the program and uh, these guys were there last year and uh, the good news was they came, the bad news was when they brought out the uh, uh, mountain lion, all of the booths were completely empty. There were 400 people back by the barn looking at the wildcat and the mountain lion. So it's, just, it's just extraordinary to see these guys um, up close and personal. It's um, a fabulous part of the event that we're glad to be able to put on again or offer again this year. So the other part of our program, half of what we do is uh, education, the other half is environmental advocacy, and so we protect birds and ecosystems and along with that plants with our advocacy. And our advocate who works very, very closely with Linda, who just stood up and uh, uh, made an eloquent uh, uh, pitch for uh, some help in the advocacy arena, is Shani Kleinhaus. And uh, we call her Super Shani. <laughs> and just a little bit of background on Shani so you know who we have working for us. And she's working for you as well. Um, we, don't, we don't monopolize her time. She works for everybody in Santa Clara County and beyond. Um, but Shani came from Israel, and in Israel they have no water. And Shani's, one of Shani's first projects was to work on uh, a wetland ecosystem that looks something like this. And the reason we call her Super Shani is that she turned it into this. <laughs> and so that's who we have working for us here in Santa Clara County. So I hope you're feeling more confident about the environmental future now that you see what Shani can do. Um, we are uh, a local organization. There are nine different Audubon chapters in the Bay Area. We're a local organization. And sometimes we overlap on a regional basis with uh, regional projects. And uh, one of those is at Altamont Pass, where the um, wind farms have had uh, uh, an extraordinary impact on raptors, raptor mortality at uh, Altamont Pass is um, through the roof. And so we, we band with um, six other Audubon chapters to bring suit against the uh, county of uh, Alameda. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the making a long story short, uh, we get involved in regional projects, and sometimes those regional projects involve the Native Plant Society as well. 
and uh, that'll, that'll be the beginning of uh, a discussion about some of the projects that we do in collaboration with the Native Plant Society. Um, this is not a project where we called in the Native Plant Society. The Audubon Society's um, joined with the Attorney General's office to um, try to, to uh, bring some sense to Altamont in terms of their practices. But it is one of the uh, first cases, and now we're, we're beset by a number of cases, where a very strong environmental voice is going up against renewable energy. And that's not a um, pleasant uh, position to be in. Um, it's not a really comfortable position to be in, uh, but we only get into those positions when we feel like it's absolutely necessary to do so. When these things do happen, um, some of you may be aware of, of the environmental organizations of the South Bay, but there's the big five, and you're looking at them. And so there's California Native Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, Committee for Green Foothills, the Sierra Club, and the Green Belt Alliance. And when there are projects or, or um, movements afoot that we think are going to have a major impact on the environment, then these groups and their representatives get together on an ad hoc basis and we try to figure out whether there should be an environmental voice or an environmental strategy to, to um, help bring um, our particular interests to bear on the, on the project. And so this is, um, these are the main links in the, in the South Bay's Conservation Council. One of those projects is Pinoch Valley, and I don't know if this chapter leads field trips to Pinoch Valley or not, but Pinoch Valley is a place where time has stood still. Um, it's represented by this mermaid's tail, or half of a mermaid's tail. Part of it's in the gray here, and part of it's in the light brown. And uh, this is uh, San Benito County, so once again we've gone outside the county, and it's... Um, and again, this is this is the mermaid's tail here. Highway 5 here, Highway 101 down here. Hollister is hiding up here somewhere in the uh, light area. Um, but an incredibly rich in biodiversity. Um, and it's a place where we've been sending field trips for decades. Um, incredibly rich in wintering raptors and uh, some uh, species of special concern threatened and endangered species. It's one of those great backroads places. And what's proposed um, there is four million solar panels. And so along with uh, the other organizations that I pictured about five slides back, we invited the Native Plant Society in as well to take a look at this project and to help us uh, sift through all of the data and all of the documents and all of the environmental review to see uh, if there were any Achilles heels or flaws in this project because we did not want this project to be built. And that's pretty much a strategy um, that uh, carries forth to today where maybe once a month, maybe once every six weeks, a project will pop up and we'll look to the Native Plant Society and your representatives for advice on a particular project and uh, what's, what's the resource value in that project in terms of habitat, in terms of plants, are there any endangered plants? Um, is there any reason or, or some way we can collaborate or a strategy that we can put together that we can um, steer a particular de development like an Ola stack um, in another direction? This, these are just some pictures from the web of what um, a landscape looks like when you have four million solar panels on it. I don't know if you guys send folks down to the Carrizo Plain or not, but that's another area that has installed massive uh, solar farms. And so if you haven't been down there in the last couple of years, that landscape has changed dramatically. <clears throat> this looks like a lot more fun. This is the kind of project that we um, like to work on together. This is um, the restoration phase one at Stevens Creek in Cupertino. And uh, in, in this project, um, there must have been about 5,000 native plants that were brought in to um, restore uh, the newly um, redesigned and reconfigured, recontoured um, stretch of uh, Stevens Creek. Uh, 
Um, and I know Jeff Caldwell was involved. I don't know who else in the chapter was involved in helping identify the uh, mosaic of species that should be should be brought in and to ensure that the, the uh, native species that were planted were uh, representative of Stevens Creek in this in this stretch of the county. Um, I want to just diverge. This will make sense in a couple minutes, I hope, but I want to diverge just for a minute or two to talk about brewing owls, see if I can't get you to fall in love with these guys, if you already uh, love them, to uh, rekindle your love for these guys and just let you um, bask in their uh, sweet little cuddly fluffy goodness. <laughs> um, we're a 24-7 brewing owl shop and when, when there's uh, some kind of danger imposed on brewing owls, then we pull out all the stops to try and figure out how to avert that danger. And so, again, this is an area where we have collaborated with Native Plant Society on many occasions to try to figure out what's going on with a particular property and, again, whether there's uh, an environmental reason uh, why we can divert a uh, development or an attack on that property. This gives you some indication of what's going on with burrowing owls in the county. Once widespread in the county, they're all up here north, mostly north of 237, north San Jose, a few uh, remaining pockets between uh, 101, north of 101, and, uh, and uh, 880. Um, but, but primarily up here where the last remaining plots of land that could be developed uh, for um, major developments uh, remains and uh, all of that land that's in that area. You would think the entire um, Santa Clara County is completely built out and completely developed, but not so. There is a building boom going on in North San Jose today um, that rivals anything from the 80s or 90s. It's uh, pretty extraordinary. And these guys are the critters that get marginalized in the process. They like the short grass habitat. This is a little bit longer grass than they usually care for. And they like to have a nice brood of kids, and they're just charismatic and curious. And um, they always look like they know exactly what's going on with you and your binoculars and your spotting scope. And when you see these guys, you, you have an instantaneous connection to what this land was 100 years ago. And uh, they, they are the most, you know, you see birds flying by. Birds are great. They're gorgeous. They're cool. But these guys, they sit still, and they stare at you, and you can almost bond with them. And uh, they, they, for us, they give us um, the best reason for trying to steer development in the best possible way in Santa Clara County. They follow the ground squirrels, so the ground squirrels uh, dig their burrows and create ground squirrel colonies, and then the brewing owls come in and they might pretty it up a little bit, but they take over. Um, they're the only ground nesting owl in the world, and they um, take over uh, where ground squirrels will allow them to move into their colonies. And what the um, burrowing owls, where the burrowing owls are at, are in these short grass fields. Unfortunately, this short grass field belongs to a major international airport <laughs> called San Jose Mineta, but they also like this short grass field, and they like this short grass field, and they like this short grass field, and, um, but all of those places are under pressure from, from development. This is uh, pretty typical. This was up in the... Um, up in this corner here. I don't, did anybody go see the Cavalia show when Cavalia was in town last summer? Anyway, that was all headquartered down here, and so this, these are the open fields right next to where Cavalia was. Um, you don't need to pay any attention to the wood chips or the berms or any of that stuff, but this is pretty typical. You've got, you've got development here, uh, Phillips Lumileds, and uh, you've got planned development here. This is now um, completely paved and ready for development. You've got development planned for here and here. And this is the way of the burrowing, uh, burrowing owls in Santa Clara County. This is uh, Mission College. Once the host of 20 to 30 pair of burrowing owls, and 
uh, at the turn of uh, the century, uh, 2000, 2001, um, there were 16 pair here. When this um, little slide was taken, there were, um, I think, three adults and two kids uh, remained here, so that was 2010. And now I think we've got two adult females there who have no, no chance of breeding. But this is how um, the entire South Bay has built out over time, as one um, bacon parcel after another gets developed. This is where um, the Venn diagram comes back into play. So one of the holdouts for growing owls in the South Bay is shoreline at Mountain View. And so this is down in the southeast corner, just adjacent, where they fly all the fancy kites is over to the left here. And then this is adjacent a little bit closer to the bay. And then there's a series of ponds that have been drained um, that are also being rehabbed. But this entire um, area is designated as growing owl habitat. And we collaborated very closely with Linda and I believe um, the mosaic of plants that are going in to uh, establish brewing owl foraging area um, may all come from the nursery. Some of them come from the nursery, your nursery. Um, and uh, over time, I think of this as time-lapse photography. That's supposed to be that Venn diagram. You're supposed to see two little circles in there. Not sure exactly why you don't see that. But this is truly the intersection between the Native Plant Society and the Audubon Society, where we're collaborating on creating habitat for those fluffy little charismatic owls that we started to see about 10 slides ago. And we're going to rely on the Native Plant Society for the next 5, 10, 15 years as each one of these parcels it is either designated as a growing owl sanctuary and we need your help to provide the right foraging, the right mosaic of uh, plants and, and shrubs and small trees um, to help take care of these, these birds. Or when Linda emails you and says we've got a problem at Olestad and they're going to try to develop this, we need you all to write letters, and we need you all to attend meetings, and we need you all to uh, stand up and say something to your local legislators about what your values are as a member of the Native Plant Society, or as a member of the Audubon Society, or somebody who wants to see some remnant of wildness left in the South Bay. So this is Phil Higgins, who is uh, doing a tour of the area after post-restoration. And I'm absolutely certain that this is what he's saying to this group. And the California Native Plant Society is making all this happen. There's the Venn diagram. So this is um, Guadalupe uh, Mines Road. And this is one of the battles that we lost. But these little, little skirmishes um, pop up, it seems like, every week. It's probably every three, every three months or so. And uh, this is one I think we called on on Linda and uh, maybe some other folks to, to try and take a look at this property and see what kind of resource value it had. But this is up near the uh, Almaden Quicksilver area, more or less um, far, far western San Jose. Uh, but the, there was a, a development that, uh, it was a vacant property, an old office building property, and, and uh, so they wanted to, to uh, squeeze in another Another little development like this, this is um, Guadalupe Creek, I forget which Guadalupe Creek. Guadalupe Creek. Yeah, and, and so they wanted to squeeze in a development. They not only wanted to squeeze in a development, they wanted to um, encroach upon the riparian buffer zone. And so um, we took issue with that, but uh, uh, somebody else prevailed in this one. We'll prevail in the next one. Uh, this is Bixby Park, and uh, again, the, the uh, effort to annex uh, 10 acres of parkland for um, a recycling plant. And again, this was a, a group effort where we called on the Native Plant Society to give us advice on what was going on with the resource values there. This is Penitentia Creek with our favorite Allen Rock Park up here and the bay down here to the left. Um, but again, this is, this is very typical of what's going on 
throughout the county, there are these little remnant rectangles and triangles right next to the creek that never got developed 30 years ago when, when these developments went in. And now if a developer can figure out how to wedge in um, three homes or seven homes or nine homes, then these projects come up here and here and uh, down creek here a little, a little ways. This is one that we did win. We uh, sent them back to the drawing board, attacked uh, their environmental impact report and uh, with the help of the Native Plant Society and the Sierra Club and the Committee for Green Foothills. And we all wrote excellent letters that uh, uh, helped push that one back to the drawing board and, and uh, made it a significantly better project. This is the big one on the horizon. This is almost right across the street from all stack. This is the water pollution control plant. And I know you all have uh, interest in what's going on there because uh, I think there's some, some endangered plant species on the property. Uh, this is um, the Don Edwards Environmental Ed Center here. This is the city of Alviso here, 237 in front. A Zanker Road that swings around here, and then this is the water pollution control plant here. But what's at issue is that they're going to come up with um, fabulous new technology that's going to erase the need for all these drying beds and give them the opportunity to relook at the use for all of this land throughout. So our interests, again, are burrowing owls out in this area where there's been a historic population for uh, decades. And then uh, everybody's interested in the rest of this from retail development to light industrial to soccer fields to you name it. And that uh, environmental impact report is due out any time now and uh, we'll be looking again to collaborate with the Native Plant Society on that on that project to ensure that uh, that land is used as best it can be used. And then of course, uh, Kevin's not here tonight, but uh, Kevin Bryant and I have been working on the Habitat Conservation Plan. I think he got tired of it. I saw Arvind at the last um, Habitat Conservation Plan meeting that I was at. I think Kevin, after eight years, finally got tired of going to those meetings and said, Arvind, you've got to go to one. But we've been working on the Habitat Conservation Plan for Santa Clara County um, for this entire area for eight years. And we think uh, in October it will finally get implemented. And that will prov provide a uh, massive influx of funding for um, preservation of habitats throughout the county. And uh, we think that will be a good thing for um, Almost all of our interests, maybe not for the burrowing owls. We fought for burrowing owls for eight years in that plan, and they've got an excellent burrowing owl plan in, in the Habitat Conservation Plan, but it's not doesn't have a lot of teeth um, involved. But uh, for your interests, I think paying attention to the Habitat Conservation Plan um, would be uh, worth your time. So Bob from the Audubon Society is coming. So I thought maybe I ought to show a couple of bird pictures. <laughs> so we're going to transition. I won't show too many, but I'm kind of a raptor geek, um, first and foremost, and then after raptors, smaller and smaller and smaller birds. And, uh, so these are birds that uh, most of you are not going to have in your um, native gardens at home, um, but certainly fly through, and certainly if you are on the on the foothills and the outskirts of development in the county, you're going to see these birds. This is a, a, a red-tailed hawk. And, and all of you understand why this was named a uh, red-tailed hawk. Yes. <laughs> because uh, early ornithologists, the, the um, dental care was pretty much non-existent. And so um, they had so many teeth missing, they couldn't pronounce orange. <laughs> but they couldn't pronounce red and it was close enough back in the day and so this became, instead of what it should have been the orange-tailed hawk this became the red-tailed hawk that's a true story really. this guy is a uh, master of riparian corridors um, it's a big bird like the red-tailed hawk but uh, you probably see them you probably hear them more than you see them this is a red-shouldered hawk absolutely gorgeous bird you ever 
um, need a red shouldered hawk fix, just go up to Rastradero and hike up for about seven minutes up to the first row of trees up there. Uh, red shouldered hawks have been nesting up there for quite a while. Our favorite uh, quintessential hovering small raptor, American kestrel. Again, a Rastradero is the place to go. White tailed kite, the same. Hate to pick on a Rastradero because I don't want, if you don't already know that as a fabulous resource, I don't want to inundate it with people. But white tailed kites nest up there, red tailed hawks nest up there, American kestrels nest up there. It's a really, really neat resource. We are um, blessed with um, parks and open spaces that are so close to where we live and so easy to get to that I think we don't realize that these are world-class facilities. Shoreline at Mountain View is a world-class birding area. A Rastradero is world-class. It just seems like some, you know, you could park in a gravel lot, you go for a walk, you know, what's the big deal? But these are not facilities that are available to the rest of the world, so um, I hope you take advantage of them, and I hope they have both birds and plant species that you like to go out and enjoy. Pair of kestrels. Male on the right, female on the left, male spotted, female street. And then if you're lucky, you go poking around on one of your native lamp walks and you hear a little screech or a scramble or somebody attentive finally looks up. You know, I was out with Paul. Is Paul in the back there? I was out with Paul one day and uh, we went on a walk and I swear we didn't look above the six inch level for an hour and a half. But if you ever do get the chance to look up. Now here's a, a guy that uh, you probably would find in your native garden at home. And also if you have feeders, of course, you'll, you'll attract these guys and they are the um, most combative, most protective, uh, most fierce um, owner of the feeder, of the hummingbird feeder that you ever want to run into. But if you pay attention, if there is a male around, then there probably is some little fumbolina type nest somewhere in one of your bushes. If you watch where the males are flying to, a female comes in and flies out again. Or sometimes early in the spring you'll see them picking little cotton seeds or some kind of little fluff from one of your plants and flying off, they're probably making a nest. It's uh, fabulous to be able to see. I don't know if everybody can see um, the female on the nest on the right there, male on the left. These are, um, so we're just going to take a look at four or five of the most common birds in the county. If you don't know your birds, these are the birds that are going to pop up the most often and create kind of the the foundation for birding and, and probably foundation for the birds that are going to show up in your yard, particularly if you have a native garden. This is a morning dove, and the zen of morning doves, once you get tired of looking at them, is to go back and see if you can see the blue eye ring. It doesn't quite pop here. Um, in some of the photos, you can see it a little bit better. And so sometimes you can go back to some of these very common birds and see very uncommon field marks and uh, keep your love alive for those birds. Spotted toad is a bird of the ground and uh, typically would not come to a feeder, but if you've got a decent native plant garden going on in the yard, then typically they will come around and they'll be in your bushes. They may even nest in your bushes and you don't even know it. And then this is California toey, and California toey is the quintessential um, little brown job or LBJ <laughs> until you take a little time, you keep your binoculars in your kitchen, you keep them out um, by your table outside in your garden and take a decent look at these guys. They've got this all this fabulous other stuff going on with the little Rufus chest, and little dark markings and they've got some, a little orange under the tail and uh, they're a really neat bird uh, once you move on, around, move away from their general, their general brownness. Western scrub jay should be familiar to everybody, even if you don't. Even if you want to call it a bluebird, that's okay. If you want to call it a blue jay, that's okay. Nobody's nobody's keeping score. But uh, our jay out here, other than uh, Stellar's jay, but the most common jay that you're going to see in the foothills is the western scrub jay. Then, of course, everybody's favorite, Ruth's, Ruth's favorite. Does everybody know that Ruth is 
the world's authority on acorn woodpeckers. Does everybody know that? <laughs> Ruth did a PhD on acorn. No, no, she no. studied these guys. She lived. It's like that's um, not, that's who was a late night. Who was who was <laughs> who was the woman who um, Diane Fossey? Who's with the Mountain Gorillas? Diane. Who was that? Was that Diane Fossey? Ruth is the Diane Fossey of acorn woodpeckers. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, they're very cool, very clown-faced, very active, uh, very colonial. Um, if you ever have an old oak tree that looks kind of sickly, you know, if there's no grandkids running around underneath it, just let it go. Don't, don't have the guy with the truck and the big saw come and pull it away. These guys need our remnant oaks. You know, they're doing uh, studies now down in, um, in Monterey County where they're taking two by fours and they're drilling holes the size of acorns and putting the two by fours up in trees because they've lost so many trees that the acorn woodpecker population is plummeting. And they're trying to figure out ways to keep the population alive. I mean, these, this is the extent, the extent that we have to go to to keep some of these species thriving in the area. These are both females, which is unusual to see two females at the nest there. Did I tell you, or did I tell you? <laughs> Northern Flicker um, is typically a bird that comes in in big numbers in the fall. They're here. They're a breeding species in Santa Clara County, but uh, we get an influx from northern birds. And, uh, they're they're quite spectacular. They're typically one of the first woodpeckers that you actually identify. You can go to your bird bird book and say, "Hey, I know what that is. That's a northern flicker." But they're not. Uh, they're they're ground feeders. They like. They have very soft bills, and uh, they like ants more than uh, more than anything else. And then, of course, this is a bird that will come to your. If you've got a suet feeder, uh, this is a bird that'll come to your suet feeder in your garden. Uh, this is the nuttall's woodpecker. And then these guys, of course, this is why you want uh, low shrubby vegetation in your gardens to attract these guys. These guys are also getting pushed out by development and uh, are a declining species in the county. That was California quail, by the way. Was anybody confused about that? You know, for years, what's the, what's the mnemonic, what's the call supposed to be for California quail? Chicago, right? Chicago. So, so there's a movement afoot that it should be changed to Lake Tahoe. <laughs> and then and then there's another movement then there's another movement that is K Paso, yes. So so anyway, so if you get an email from Linda that says we need people to write letters about the mnemonic for the California quail call, respond. Please respond. Speak up. And these guys, you know, I've I've uh, seen, so this is a killdeer, this is a shorebird, but uh, they're often nowhere near the shore, and they will um, nest in uh, loose uh, shavings and wood chips, and uh, I've seen them up at um, uh, the cemetery at um, Rancho San Antonio, that's uh, blanking in my mind here. Um, but in any event, this is a bird that you might see around your garden. Don't be, don't be shocked if you do. We've seen the spotted tohi up at the top earlier, but it's often confused um, with a quick look because of the black and white pattern and the black and white pattern and the orangey pattern and the orangey pattern with black-headed grosbeak. Spotted tohi is a year-round resident. Black-headed grosbeak is an incoming migrant that'll come in in, in uh, mid-March and stay until right about now. They're pretty much cleared out of here, but spectacular bird that will come to a seed feeder these guys, I've never seen them come to a seed feeder unless it's some um, uh, scrap seed that's fallen below the feeder. So one, one works through the trees and the bushes, the other one stays on the ground primarily. I don't know why that's out of uh, sequence, but this is the classic broken wing display. Of, uh, many birds employ this technique, but it's to make you think that the bird is injured, and so you go after the injured bird while the young go crawling off in the grass and hiding under a bush somewhere. That's the broken wing display. T tell me that that's a native plant. 
Yeah. Amen. See? I could have needed a plant. So again, these are um, cedar wax wings. Uh, there's only one or two breeding records. This is typically a bird that comes in this time of year and is here all winter in very, very large numbers. And if you've got any uh, berry bushes around around the yard or the neighborhood, then you should expect a visit from cedar wax wings. Or maybe not. Absolutely gorgeous bird. Mm -hmm. I was going to delete this, and then I got involved in something else. But the cedar wax wings, so what follows the cedar wax wings then are the merlin. And the Merlin is a type of falcon, same size as the hovering American kestrel that I showed you earlier. And the Merlin goes after small birds. The kestrel goes after small mammals. But the Merlins will hunt cooperatively, where one of the Merlins will go a little bit ahead and fly below the canopy, and they'll scare the birds up. And the second bird comes in flying above the canopy and grabbing the birds as they fly up above the canopy. It's pretty, pretty slick cooperative hunting technique. And that's what happens to uh, this poor guy. What is the poor guy? Well, I, I'm, I'm, like I'm guessing a hard lark. It might be a dark-eyed junco. Um, certainly has white tail feathers. Um, but I'm guessing it's a hard lark. Uh, Lassali bunting may be arguably the prettiest bird that comes into the county on an annual basis. And uh, these guys you wouldn't expect to come to the yard, although they were within 50 yards of our garden um, at McClellan Ranch last year, there was an invasion of lazuli buntings. Um, but they typically nest up in Arastradero, Ranch of San Antonio, um, below Stevens Reservoir, not above it, but below it, um, up in Montebello, up past all the winding turns up to um, the gate up at the top of Montebello before you hit uh, the skyline. Um, but the foothill scrub area with, with scattered oaks, um, they really like that. It absolutely looks like a bluebird, um, but certainly doesn't sing like one. It has um, just a, a prettier tone um, of blue to it, or a more unique tone. Lazuli is a gemstone, a new gemstone, and so that's where they get their name. Um, and then this, all this other neat stuff going on. Don't get me started. If you're lucky, I can't believe anybody, anybody have a water feature in their yard that has ever attracted a wood duck? How about a hooded merganser? So both of these guys, absolutely fabulous um, duck species in the county and typically are found in remote corners of our reservoirs or small ponds um, that are tucked away. Uh, wood ducks probably in Stephen's uh, reservoir um, is probably the too. easiest. Sorry again? We've seen them at Stevens Creek. Yeah, and in the creek, of course. <laughs> and then these guys are certainly seen in, in uh, Stevens Creek, um, in, the, in the little pond uh, out in Barcadero Road, uh, at the end of Gang Road, uh, in Palo Alto, uh, Thompson Creek, down by Lake Cunningham. Uh, again, they're migrants, so they'll just be coming in probably not for another month or so, but then they'll be with us for for uh, four months or so, and just absolutely gorgeous birds. What are they? Hooded merganser. Note the little skinny bill. The mergansers are fish eaters, and so they have a little skinny bill with a serrated edge to the um, upper and lower mandible that help them grab and hold on to the fish. <coughs> so, um, if you ever get a bird box and decide that you want a few more birds around your house, um, the birds that you might expect to pop up and to occupy and, and to uh, keep you company are some of the smaller cavity nesters, oak titmouse on the left, and our very own uh, chickadee uh, for California, chestnut back chickadee, at least in the lowlands of California. And I have no idea what the difference is between those two sets of pictures. I think I just copied it twice. <laughs> For those of you, truth in advertising, for those of you who thought that I would be talking about this wonderful blend of birds and native plants that can happen when, when uh, you either um, put yourself through great effort or you get an expert to help you switch over your garden to native plants and what you might be able to expect and, and how to go about doing that. Well, that wasn't tonight. So, so Arvind, 
and uh, Toby Goldberg of our staff have collaborated on um, attract, turning your garden over into native plants and attracting birds to your gardens. Uh, they do a great one-two punch on a program that they've done many times. You've got to invite them back to do it here again. Um, but I'm not uh, silly enough to try and think that I could step in and fill their shoes. So they've got um, a series of plants that are compatible for birds and beautiful photographs. I would not be shocked if some of these are Arvin's uh, photographs and uh, can absolutely regale you all night long with, with tales of what birds can be brought into your garden if you plant these plants. We are now in our 88th year. We're still serving our local community. We are still collaborating with the Native Plant Society. We think we make a great partnership with what you're doing. We think we both uh, do a great service to the South Bay community. We look forward to more and more projects together. Thank you so much. Thank you.